Creating an Engaging Classroom, Transforming Passive Students into Active Learners by Dr. Rodney Davis, Associate Professor at Troy University. For the Philippines, Professional Linkages from Various Disciplines Incorporated Conference, Ramblan City, September 8th through 10th, 2017. Hello, my name is Dr. Rodney Davis, and I am happy to be with you as your presenter in this session uh, on teaching strategies. Now, for the last few days, you have heard from various speakers who are experts in their field and are addressing teaching strategies that were related to specific subjects. So you may have some that talked about some math strategies or social studies or even language strategies. It, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do something a little different uh, in my session with you and, and that is I'm going to look at uh, teaching strategies that are related to an engaged learning environment. And I believe that uh, they will fit in any of the disciplines. Uh, so if you're a math teacher, these strategies will work with math. Or if you're a history teacher, they'll work with history. And even if you're a MAPE teacher, they'll work, work in those subjects or disciplines as well. Uh, now, what I'm going to do first is I want to talk about the engaged classroom, uh, what that looks like, why we need to have uh, classrooms where uh, students are engaged in, in what's going on. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about Bloom's Taxonomy, the cognitive domain. I know you had this as a part of your, your teacher prep program. I'm just going to hit it very lightly because I want to address higher order thinking skills and the engaged classroom. Because we can create all kinds of activities for kids to be involved in. They can have fun, and I believe in fun and education. But if there's no higher order thinking going on, all we did was we entertained them for a half hour or 45 minutes. So I want to talk a little bit about what those higher order thinking skills are. And then I'm going to talk about strategies that have been kind of put in a, a larger category called total participation techniques. Because one of the challenges that we find with whatever strategy we use in the classroom to engage the learner, we're going to have some learners who just sit back in the shadows. They let other students answer questions. And so it comes down to teachers not really knowing if every student understands the content that has been presented. So I'm going to give you some techniques that are going to help you to determine whether or not the students are really understanding what you're saying and can they demonstrate their knowledge, which is why I want to talk about higher order thinking skills and how to measure that. I wish I could be with you at, in the marble capital of the Philippines. Uh, I've seen pictures of uh, that area, kind of the eastern uh, Visayas area near Masbate. Uh, I've not been there personally. I've been in and around that area. So I, I certainly look forward to an opportunity uh, to be in that area personally. I'm a teacher at Troy University here in uh, Dothan, Alabama, southeastern part of the United States. So uh, because of teaching responsibilities, I can't be with you right now. So we're going to do this by video. And this presentation will be about 30 to 45 minutes. And I realize that that can be a challenge because it's not always easy to understand me. So if I'm going a little too fast, ask uh, Diego if he wouldn't mind rewinding the video a little bit and let's hear it again because that's the joy of uh, having a video you can uh, rewind it and listen to a section over and over uh, but if that's not practical because of the way the conference is set up then the next best thing is to obtain a copy of this video it's free of charge all you have to do is ask uh, Diego to get you a copy of it and then you can listen to me as many times as you want so I'm going to be popping in both visually and and mostly auditorily throughout the presentation so you'll be able to hear me not always able to see me because I've got some slides that I want you to see at the end I'll give you my contact information so you know how to reach me uh, so looking forward to uh, learning together
on this engaged classroom and how we develop students who are active learners. Have you ever noticed how teachers or adults, for that matter, react in a professional development seminar? Just sit at the back of the room and, and watch the people as you're watching the presenter, especially in a case where it's what we call a stand and deliver seminar, or a, here in the United States we call it a sit and get conference. After a while, even the adults who are behaving politely will start to get bored with what the speaker is saying. Even though it may be critical information, they get bored because, again, the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. And if you're sitting on a hard seat, after a while you get tired of listening to someone drone on about something uh, that even you may be required to attend. And what will happen is they are going to find a way to politely disengage. Their bodies are still in the room, but their minds are very, very far from it. Now, some may be digging in their purses or they're digging in their book bags or backpacks. Others are more 21st century type uh, learners, and so they're texting their friends, they're surfing the net on their phone, they're even checking social media or playing some of the online games that you can get access to. Why this happens, of course, is simply that our minds can only stay engaged so long. No matter how much we are interested in the topic, our brains have to constantly be exposed to something new. And so what happens is after the newness of the topic or the environment wears off and, and maybe it's after a meal has been served and so we're kind of tired from, from eating and, and our, our bodies are digesting the great food that we just had for lunch, our minds get a little bored and therefore we lose interest. This same thing happens to students in school. Unfortunately, they don't have the luxury of messing with their cell, cell phone, looking at uh, things on the internet, or texting a friend. They have to be more attentive to what's going on. Now, that doesn't mean that students who become bored with what's happening in the classroom won't disengage. Oh, they will. And some of them will creatively disengage. Uh, they'll start to disrupt the class when they get bored. Their bodies are just like adults in that their mind can only absorb what their seats can endure. And if they've been sitting for a long time, they've got energy to burn. And so they're getting really overactive and they're wanting to do something. And they can only listen so long before they start to disengage. Now, they'll either find very positive ways to do it, which means they will uh, look at you, but maybe doodle on a piece of paper, or they may find some negative ways, which is the disruption side of this disengagement. So why is it this way? Well, our brains are designed to be curious. They want to know the, the world around them. And the way they do that, the way our brains do this, is they use our five senses, our, our sense of sight, our sense of taste and smell and our hearing, and our tactile senses, those in our fingers and in our feet. That's how the brain learns about the world around it. And so what happens in many cases is that when the level of stimulation starts to decrease, the brain starts to focus on other things because it needs to maintain that level of curiosity, that level of input. And so we start to daydream. We think about things we've done. If there's nothing new coming in, the brain is thinking about things that it's already experienced and exploring those in more detail. Or we start to engage in things around us. We, we play with things. We fidget it with things. We, we dig into our purses or into our backpacks. We start to use the technology we have around us in order to increase that level of stimulation. And while we think it's, it's just happening, it's a biological reaction. It's the way our brains were designed to work. 
So if we want students to retain things, we want them to learn and remember, then what we have to do is constantly be stimulating them, using those, those senses of sight and taste and touch and smell and hearing, vision as well, so that they can uh, keep that level of stimulation. Now this generation probably is more inclined to need this stimulation because they've grown up with television and the internet and that is constantly stimulating them with images and sounds and colors and shapes. So if we're not doing that, it stands to reason, it's logical that people are going to disengage. And what we know about lectures is that the longer the person talks, the greater the likelihood the audience is going to start to daydream and think about other things. What we can do is to create an engaging classroom where activity or being active is the rule. So an engaging classroom, when you say, what is that? That's a classroom that's colorful. From the paint on the wall, to the pictures on the wall, to the layout of the room, it is something that is attracting and stimulating their visual senses. But also, a, an engaging classroom is challenging. The work that's done there, the learning that takes place there, requires students to think. Thirdly, a an engaging classroom is a relevant classroom so that they are learning things that they need to know as well as things they want to know and connections are made between what they're learning in the classroom with what they're learning out in the community and what's happening out in the community where the kids live. Lastly, an engaging classroom is collaborative. Students want to work with each other. They want to partner with their friends. They want to talk with their friends. They want to relate to their friends and so when teachers can use that collaborative need that kids have as a part of the learning process of course it's going to make the classroom more engaging but besides just making the environment engaging we also need to make the environment active so we need to allow for movement and in an active classroom, the teacher's role is facilitative. They're not the sage on the stage. They're not standing necessarily at the front of the room. As a matter of fact, the layout of the room may be quite different because it has to allow for the energy to flow in that room where students are in small groups. Desks are arranged in little pods throughout the room or the chairs are arranged in small groups. There's more of a modular layout to the room so that certain things are done in certain places. And even in Filipino classes where the rooms themselves may be physically small and the number of students may be rather large, you still can arrange the room so students can be actively engaged. But an engaging and active learning environment is only one half of the process to creating active learners. The other half of it is higher order thinking skills. So that instead of asking just comprehension questions, what is the capital of the province, who is this famous person, we start to ask students to think using Bloom's cognitive taxonomy in the upper levels of, of that taxonomy. So we're looking at analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating. And just as a reminder, when we analyze, what we do is we break things down into their component parts. We look at the individual pieces and then we put all the pieces back together to see how they work together. And then we combine what we know and we've already learned with what we are learning so that we're building on previous knowledge and then we're evaluating what we've learned and what the theories are to be sure that they're still relevant. That's part of Bloom's taxonomy in the higher order range of, of the taxonomy. But as we do these two things and put them together, engaging and active learning environments and then focusing on higher order thinking skills, what we do is we combine our activities with higher order thinking skills so that we're not just asking questions that 
it's a one word yes or no or the the correct answer is but we're asking questions that require students to think on deeper and higher levels well I've used the idea that we need to create active learners well how do we activate the learner well first we create the environment where the the learner is going to be and we as I said make that an engaging environment and what happens is that we energize the student. We, we increase their attention and their level of participation. But here's the question. Some students already come to class pretty energized. They're the kids who always have their hand raised the first time. And there's a series of those students, maybe five or six or maybe a quarter of your class. Their hands are up as soon as you ask the question. But what about the kids who don't raise their hands, who are kind of hiding in the background, hoping that the teacher never calls on them? How do we activate them? Because the, the idea is we want all of the students to be active learners. But we also need to know that activity in and of itself is not the goal. We want to be sure that all students understand uh, what the content is and that they are correctly understanding. So what we do and to make that happen is we appeal to their curiosity. So we ask questions that cause them to think first. Hmm, I wonder what happens if we do X and Y. Or what would have happened if this famous person had done something different? Appeal to their curiosity, the what ifs. Kids, especially in elementary school, are constantly asking, what if this happened? How would the outcome be different? Secondly, we give them autonomy to think. We give them time to think. We, we tell them that it's okay for them not to have the answer right away, that they need to take some time and reflect. And we give them that freedom to do that. We give them room for them to kind of take charge of how they're going to respond to the teacher. And then lastly, we create conditions where interactivity is the goal, where students are able to interact not only with the content, the question they are being asked, but interact with their classmates so that they can bounce ideas off of each other. And when we, we use these three uh, skills that teachers possess, appealing to curiosity, granting autonomy, and encouraging interactivity, we will find that the level of their attention increases, the level of their energy also increases. I found these three participatory techniques in a book uh, by two authors, uh, their husband and wife, uh, Persida and William Himele, and they wrote the book Total Participation Techniques, Making Every Student an Active Learner. I encourage you to get it. It's published by the uh, Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development. Uh, it's probably in a library uh, there in the Philippines that you can get a hold of it's an awesome book it gives you 37 techniques the ones that I've chosen are the think pair and share the hold-ups and the lineups and and these are techniques that activate learners 
So these are techniques that work with the strategies you've already received this week. Now I know that you have received some very good strategies that are discipline specific. The strategies that I'm sharing with you here are not tied to any discipline. But what they do is they engage the the learner, they activate the learner, and they raise the level of participation. And they do it in a way that is non-threatening. So if you have a shy learner, these, these strategies work with them. If you have a very active learner, this allows them to take time to think before they respond. So we'll look at these three uh, techniques. And I said there are 37 of them. So in future presentations, you may see others uh, listed as well. But these are the three we'll focus on here. The think, pair, and share, holdups, and then lineups. For the think, parent, share uh, technique, I found a diagram by uh, Jesse Gentile, and I thought, why reinvent the wheel? Let's just use his uh, diagram. And the way he has it listed here, and, and this, like I said, this concept of think, parent, share is not a new one. It's it's been around for a long time. But what's different about it is that we we really focus it towards higher order thinking. So the way it works, as you probably know, is that a teacher poses a question that the, the students are supposed to think about first. So the first step, you see the students think and write out their answers to that prompt or to the question that they've been provided. And, and this takes place over maybe one minute. It's not a long time to think. It's, it's pretty quick. Uh, then they are paired up with a classmate, maybe somebody sitting next to them or, or uh, another uh, student across the room. The goal of the pairing is for the students to share their best answers to the prompt or to the question. And they agree on what, what's the best answer. Then the students share their new and improved answer with the class. So in other words, they have to achieve consensus. They can't each share their own best answer. They have to come up with a new best answer. And, and then that's what's shared with the class. So the think, pair, and share is something that you can do on the spur of the moment. But what makes it higher order thinking is that you have asked them to analyze something. You've asked them to synthesize something. You've asked them to evaluate, to make a judgment about something. So in, in this model, your prompt is really the key. You, you've got to come up with a good prompt that uh, will cause the students to think about something uh, in, a, in a new way. The second strategy is called a hold-up strategy, and you'll see here on the slide I've given you examples of cards that are, are held up, and you have multiple choice cards, A, B, C, D, E, or F, and you have at the bottom on the left-hand side of the slide, you have cards, and you just write these out on paper, and you can write the words true, not true, true with modifications, or unable to determine, and each student gets a set of four cards and you like I said you can write them or print them on paper for them laminate them if you have the capability of laminating them but you give them to the students and then once every student has a set of cards the teacher poses an essential question the students are then asked to think about what's the right answer they can discuss their answer with the kids sitting next to them or in, a, in another group. They can, can have even a group discussion, a small group. Then, at the end, when everyone's had a chance to discuss and they've thought about their answer, the teacher calls the class to order and says, hold it up. And basically what they're saying is hold up the response card. One student from each group may be then asked to explain the group's answer. So every group may come up with a different answer or multiple groups come up with the same answer. But then the follow-up, and this is where we bring in the higher order aspect of it, is the students are asked to explain why did you choose answer A? Or why did you say that the answer is true? What, what shaped your opinion on it? This is a great way to see 
how much the students have absorbed about what you've been teaching. And it allows you then to clarify any misconceptions. If they got the answer wrong, that's an opportunity for you to reteach something or to discuss it as a whole class. Why is the right answer B versus A? And I know A seems like the right answer, but why is B really the right answer? And then you can have students explaining to students the rationale for the, the right answer. So not only you tell them, but the students tell them. This is a great way just to see what students already know and and what students maybe don't have a real firm understanding of what you've been teaching. So this is a great technique to engage learners, activate them, because they have to move, they have to hold up a card. It's not just sitting and raising their hand, they're holding up a card saying, this is the right answer. And you can survey the room from the front and see which kids have the right answer, which kids don't. And, and it kind of gives you an immediate response as to, wow, the, these kids really don't understand this concept. I need to go back and, and reteach some of the core aspects of the con concept. And it works in the Philippines great, even with large classes, because all you have to do is you're scanning the room looking at uh, those cards. The third strategy is called a lineup. And this is the one that requires really the most movement because students will actually have to physically get up out of their desk and move to another part of the room. You may want to uh, take the kids outside the classroom and do this in the common area of the school. The kids would love that anyway. But it would kind of get them up and moving around. And what we know from the research about kinesthetics is that there are a lot of students who need that movement to help their brains process. And there's been just tons of research on how movement really does help kids to retain what they've learned. But here's how it works. Uh, the teacher poses a very broad, open-ended question, not, not just a, a question you can answer with an A, B, C, or D. These questions have no right or wrong answers. So there's a lot of different answers to the questions. They've got to be broad. And again, you want to focus your questions towards the higher order thinking skills of analysis, synthesis, and evaluation kinds of questions. Now, before the kids move, once you have posed the questions, the students take time at their desk or in their chairs to reflect, to think about what they have been asked, take some notes, maybe even look at some of their books to help them jot some notes down. Then, you call them to line up, and you divide the class into two groups. Lineups are probably the easiest way to do it, but if you have a very large group, you might want to do concentric circles. That's a circle within a circle. But we'll just use the lineup for, for sake of discussion here. Again, you can modify this as your space allows. Have two parallel lines, and they have to face each other. And... Basically, you start out with, okay, take the first prompt and take turns discussing it with the person across from you. So they talk about it with the person that they're facing. After a few minutes, you ring a bell or you make a sound, and that indicates it's time for them to talk about the next prompt. But you don't want them talking about the next prompt with the same student. So what you want to do is you have one of the lines move. So the very first person in the line, he goes to the end of the line, and everyone else moves over two spaces until they are facing a new classmate. Then they start discussing the second prompt. And this goes on until you've gone through all of the questions that you were, were going to ask or all of the prompts. Maybe you do one, maybe you do two. It just depends on what you have in the lesson. Then as a whole group, when you return to your desks, you do a debrief. And that's where you, you talk about the individual prompts and you kind of get some input from everybody. Now, you can start your prompts with these samples I've put in pink at the, the very top of the slide. What are your thoughts about? Explain why you feel this way. What ways has blank affected blank, X affected Y? Again, these are just things to get the students to, to start thinking. And you use the same prompt when you do the debrief at the end.
and this is again another way to get kids moving it also is connected to higher order thinking skills which is awesome for the kids because they're thinking on deeper and deeper levels and that is really what we want them to do we want them to think deeply about uh, these questions not just give that superficial uh, short yes or no answer or uh, basic knowledge factoid type answer what is the capital of when did this happen or when, why did uh, what, what day did that happen you probably know what they say about time it certainly flies by when you're having fun and here we are at the end of my session we looked at three particular uh, total participation strategies or techniques. The first one we looked at was the think, pair, and share. Not a new one, I admit it. It's been around for a while, but what I think we did with it uh, in this session is we really talked about how it needs to be paired with higher order thinking skills. And then we talked about uh, total participation techniques that relate to movement. So I gave you a sample of a lineup or concentric circles, which is a great way to, to involve lots of students. And then finally, we also talked about a holdup, uh, a total technique uh, holdup where students show cards in reference to uh, prompts that they've been given in a classroom. I hope that uh, you can see that these work in Filipino classes. They're not designed just for American classes. They work well in Filipino classes uh, just as easy. And, and this is just three of, of many, many presentations. So hopefully in the future, I'll be able to add some techniques to this so that uh, you can, can get the benefit of those other techniques. What I'd like you to do now uh, is I really want you to practice these techniques or at least plan for them. You may not be able to practice them right now because you're at a conference, but what I'd like you to do is to take some time and, and get with a partner, someone who teaches in the same discipline or the same grade level that you teach, and, and take each of these examples that I gave you and really uh, connect it to something that you teach. So if you're going to use the think, pair, and share, I want you to think about a specific example that you could use, a prompt that you could use uh, with it. And if you're going to do the, the hold up one where you hold up the cards, then think of a prompt that you would use that with. Or, or if you're going to do the, the total uh, participation technique and it's going to be a movement related one, then how might you do that? So use some time while you're at this conference to kind of really put some flesh on the bones. In other words, make it very useful to you by connecting it to something that you're doing right now. And, and that will be your workshop portion of my presentation. And one of the uh, conference leaders will talk with you about uh, your your ideas and, and kind of give everybody a chance to share what they came up with in the workshop. So let's do that next. Uh, I'm going to give you my contact information here in just a second and then we'll break and, and do the uh, workshop part and the debrief after that. If you'd like to contact me, here is my address and email. I'm at Troy University. Just send it to Troy University, attention Dr. Rodney Davis, P.O. Box 8368, Dothan, Alabama 36303, United States of America. My email address is davisr at troy.edu. Really enjoyed being with you and look forward to another presentation with you in the future. Take care.